The Helicaster Chain Show airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. The podcast's always available online at helicasterchain.com. Listen, you have been involved in some extraordinary digs. God bless you. I mean, I can I come? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is like the... Actually, go to our website, check it out. I yeah. would, you have no idea. <laughs> this is really, truly the dream of my life. But you're like the superstar of archaeology these days. It's true. You're like the female Indiana Jones, kiddo. I mean... <laughs> Love oh. it. It's true. People it's love you. You can't see me cringing. No, no, no. But people <laughs> love you. You do know that. I mean, you are well respected. You've earned quite the world of respect in, in the field, and you should be proud of that. And you should be given kudos for that. So I'm doing that for you. I mean, I did a lot of research oh, well, on thank you. you. <laughs> Modest, humble, that she is. Her name? Jody Magnus, renowned archaeologist, a true female Indiana Jones, specializing in the archaeology of ancient Palestine, participant in over 20 digs, including Hukok, and now lending her expertise to a very important series premiering Sunday, April 3rd, 9 p.m. Eastern, on the National Geographic Channel, The Story of God, with Morgan Freeman. Professor Magnus will be with me in a minute. But first, welcome to the Hallie Kasser Jane Show. I am your host, Hallie Kasser Jane. The Hallie Kasser Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Get a free audiobook and 30 day trial today by visiting my website at HallieKasserJane.com and clicking on the Audible.com icon for your free book. Hey, what's more fun than a free book? And remember, the Hallie Kasser Jane Show is always available online at HallieKasserJane.com and a host of venues, including Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, TuneIn Radio, iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, and on the iHeart Radio Network. Since 2002, Jody Magnus has held the Senior Endowed Chair in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the Keenan Distinguished Professor for Teaching Excellence in Early Judaism. She previously taught at Tufts University. She received her B.A. in Archaeology and History from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and her Ph.D. in Classical Archaeology from the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Magnus was Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in Syro Palestinian Archaeology at the Center for Old World Archaeology and Art at Brown University. She is the first Vice President of the Archaeological Institute of America. Jody Magnus has published ten books, including The Archaeology of the Holy Land and dozens of articles specializing in the archaeology of ancient Palestine, modern Israel, Jordan, and Judea and Samaria. Her research interests include Jerusalem, Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls, ancient synagogues, Masada, the Roman army in the east, and ancient pottery. She's participated in 20 excavations in Israel and Greece, and in 2011, she began to dig at Hukok, uncovering some of the most amazing mosaics ever found. On Sunday, April 3rd, 9 p.m. Eastern, Professor Magnus can be seen on the National Geographic Channel when it premieres The Story of God with Morgan Freeman, which takes viewers on a trip around the world to explore different cultures and religions on the ultimate quest to uncover the meaning of life, God, and all the questions in between. As you are about to learn, Professor Magnus is a fascinating woman, fearless and forthright. Let's talk. Listen to me. A lot of us dream of becoming archaeologists. I'm one of them. It was one of my dreams when I was a kid, but you made that dream come true. So that right there makes me love you. And your dream began when you were yeah. just a kid, right? I mean, tell us about that. That's yes. pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, well, actually, I decided I wanted to become an archaeologist when I was 12 years old. And it was, people ask why. So it was a combination of things. I had a really good 
history teacher in seventh grade. We did world history, and I fell in love with ancient Greece. And um, then at the same time, I was going to Girl Scout camp and finding fossils of shells and things like that, and uh, sort of had the usual childhood fascination with dinosaurs. And it just all sort of came together, and I decided I wanted to be an archaeologist. I even have it in my ninth grade yearbook under my photo. It says the ambition that says archaeologist. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I really do. But you weren't kidding around, though. You you wound up uh, finishing high school in, in Israel? I did. Yes, that's right. I uh, moved to Israel on my own for my last year of high school and then stayed there and did my undergraduate degree at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So you tell me about your parents. They're... they're, they're... <laughs> That's just great. They must have done a, I mean, they did a terrific job. Obviously, they gave you a lot of hoots, but <laughs> what? I don't... Yeah, they were they were very good. I mean, they believe me, they were not happy about their sixteen year old daughter moving on her own to Israel. Uh, but um, but they they've been very supportive of me, and and so yeah, I have to give them a lot of credit. It's and true. they're very proud Jewish parents living in South Florida. So they're listening. To <laughs> uh, they're living. They're in my I neck. Of, yeah, they're in my neck of the woods. That's me. I'm down here now too. Oh my gosh, we all, all of us <laughs> wind up being in Florida sooner or later, maybe, or Israel. So listen to me, what this, this is, this, this does fascinate me. I'm curious as to what fascinated you about it. What were you trying to, what were you looking to maybe uncover? Was it a religious quest? Was it, was it looking into the life of Jesus? Were you maybe had a part of you that was Nancy Drew looking for a clue into the secret of all? I mean, what becomes an archaeologist? Seriously, I, I, I want to know what's in you guys that's different than, than others. Uh-huh. Well, um, geez. Okay. So I, I, you know, archaeology is about the study of the past. So in a sense, it's very closely related to history. The difference is that archaeologists base their uh, study of the past on different sources of information. So whereas historians primarily learn about the past from studying literary sources, you know, written texts uh, or documents, archaeologists study the past based on the uh, material remains of human culture. That is anything that, that people manufactured and left behind, we dig up and we study that and use it to, to, to learn about the past. So really, archaeology is not about uh, treasure hunting, and it's not about necessarily validating religious beliefs, although sometimes archaeologists do go in with those kinds of interests. But it's really, it's really uh, about learning about the past and doing it in a very kind of physical way. I think that's why people are so fascinated with archaeology, because you dig up things that, you know, people, let's say 2,000 years ago, manufactured, handled, used. It's a very kind of visceral uh, way to learn about the past. Science, art, or both? It's, it's all of the above. That, that's what makes archaeology unique, which is that it, it really is uh, interdisciplinary. I mean, in, in academia, the word interdisciplinary gets thrown around all the time. And, and to be fair, most disciplines are interdisciplinary to varying degrees. But honestly, I know of no other single discipline that is as interdisciplinary as, as archaeology in the sense that archaeology includes everything, arts, humanities, social sciences, hard sciences. Um, in that sense, I think it's unparalleled. Hmm. That does explain you a lot then. <laughs> That's where we're all about to find out. <laughs> a very multifaceted well, I, lady. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm not. I'm not equally. You know, I don't have equal expertise in all of those various disciplines. But anybody who's an archaeologist and works in the field has to draw on um, people with those various expertises in order to be able to work. So, you know, when I dig, I have a team of specialists uh, who work on the different categories of finds that we have. And they do, in fact, come from all of those different disciplines. I have an art historian on my team. I have people who specialize in animal bones on my team, in coins and pottery and, and, and so all sorts of different things. But also, it would seem to me that you have to have an interest, a, a really wide and varied interest to be the kind of person who would even pursue this kind of, you know, career. So that says a lot, too. You know, some of us are, are very linear uh, or very singly uh, focused, obviously. <laughs> that does not mean you, Jody. So I love that about uh, you. So. Right? It's true. It's true. It's true. So so I want to talk to you about this because your expertise became the Middle East. And I'm curious as to, in that particular world, 
for going into searching the history and doing archaeology because you know that religion is built into that part of the world. I mean, you can't go yeah. anywhere. So that also makes you, having focused on that particular area, uh, something different. Some, talk to me about religion and how that might play into, and we're, we're going to pursue this as we go along in different levels, but at least to, to begin with, uh, how you pursue what it is you're doing. Does it get in the way sometimes? Uh, what, does religion get in the way? Yes, you're, you're, yes, yes. Oh, um, it's political well, football. I I would, well, wow, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> so so yeah, you're right. I mean, so I did end up eventually focusing on the Middle East or what we call in the ancient world, the Near East. It's the same thing. It's just a difference between modern versus ancient times. Um, and, and And it's true. So, you know, Pretty much all of my field work has been in Israel, and it's really impossible to work in the periods I work in Israel without getting involved to some degree in in religions and religious history, just because it's the period of you know early Judaism and the rise of Christianity, and um, and and in fact that's sort of how I ended up in a department of religion studies. I teach in a department of religion studies, which is very unusual for an archaeologist. I mean, by training, I'm a classical archaeologist, which means I do Greek and Roman archaeology. And so usually people who do classical archaeology end up in departments of classics or maybe art history, but not normally religious studies. So that really is due uh, to the place where I happen to work in the period of time that I happen to work in. And, and because a lot of my research focuses on the time of Jesus, there's also, you know, I've become kind of an expert on archaeology relating to that sort of thing, you know, Jerusalem in the time of Jesus, Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, the burial of Jesus, that sort of thing. Um, so yes, and, and, and I think that it's fair to say that there are many, not necessarily most, but there are many archaeologists who work in Israel because they have an interest in various aspects of the ancient religions, whether it's, you know, biblical archaeology relating to the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament or whatever, that that isn't necessarily what, what drove me, at least not originally. So I didn't go in with that interest. My interest has always been in the classical world. And so I ended up simply working in the classical periods, the Greek and Roman periods in Israel. But that said, it really then becomes impossible to work in those periods in Israel without becoming involved in, you know, how all of this relates to religion. So I guess the religions came up for me as kind of a side thing as a result of my original interest and not, that's not something that I went in with originally. But there it um, is, right. But there it is. Yeah. Talk to me about this too, because a lot of what you do is, isn't a lot of what you have to do is fundraising. I mean, you have, this is an enormous oh, yeah. experience expensive thing. Yeah. So to become the great yeah. archaeologist, you also have to be the great <laughs> fundraiser. And I wanted to just touch on that because I, I respect that, that you can get all this to happen. That, that you know, you're like a yeah. team leader. Good for you. Talk to me. Well, thank you for asking. Um, that That's actually, you know, it's funny. As academics, we really are not, we're never, we were never taught about fundraising. So, and, and fundraising does not come naturally to me. And it's only with my current project, which began in 2011, that I've really had to fundraise because in the past I was involved with projects that were funded from sources where I didn't have to worry about it. Or I was working with people who brought money, so I didn't have to fundraise myself. But since 2011, I've been excavating this amazing ancient village in Galilee, near the Sea of Galilee, called Hukok. We have a website, hukok.org, H-U-Q-O-Q.org. <laughs> and we are bringing to light the remains of a monumental synagogue building of the late Roman period, the 5th century. And it is decorated with the most amazing mosaic floors you have ever seen, including scenes depicting the biblical hero Samson and all sorts of other amazing stuff. And you would think that uh, with the kind of discoveries that we're making, that the money would just be pouring in on its own. But it doesn't, as I've discovered, it doesn't happen that way. So I literally do have to scramble every year now to raise money for the dig. And it currently costs about $200,000 a year for, for my project. So I, I raise the money through various sources. Some of it comes from my university and other universities, although I must say that's not a big chunk of it. Uh, a lot of it comes from student fees. I run it as a field school for, for students, uh, undergraduate students, and they get academic credit. So I get, you know, student fees from that. And then the rest is a combination of, you know, foundations, organizations like National Geographic. And, and now I just got a fellowship from the, um, a grant from the Loeb Classical Library Foundation, for example, um, and and some private donations. I haven't hit the big private donor yet. That would be the great thing. I, I haven't got, 
you know, I haven't got the sugar daddy yet and that's what I would love to have. But so for now, it's like, you know, just cobbling together whatever I can every year to get us through each season. But I think it was important to talk about because it's an enormous amount of work that takes away time from you doing it, what you really should be is. doing, number one. And number yes. two, it just is yes. kind of a sad thing that that's built in and that we don't have programs it, that would right. help us get in there because this is, after all, looking for antiquities and, and in restoring and, you know, and, 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 and defending and and we're going to talk about that in a minute, too. I want to talk to you about the yeah, Bible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I just had to bring that up. But I want to talk to you about the Bible because so much of what you do in the world that you are, you know, based on things that we read in the Bible. And I want to ask you about this because I was curious as to how you look at this. Old New Testaments, how, how do you interpret what you read? Is it a religious text? Is it a historical document, a book of clues, allegorical? I imagine that how one perceives the Bible also influences how they work in a way. Yes? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, wow, that's another big question. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, the, you know, the Bible, and here I'm including both the Old, the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, was not written uh, as an historical document. So the people who wrote it, and there were many different people who contributed to both of these works over the course of of time and, and edited and re-edited and so on. Um, those people did not write these these works uh, for the purposes of providing us with history, certainly not in any modern uh, you know sense of the word which views history as supposedly objective, whatever that is. But it, these were not written as history books. Uh, and so so it is it is wrong then to approach them as as literal historical documents, right? That's not that was not their purpose. That said, there certainly is historical information embedded in both the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament and in in the New Testament. And so, you know, I think pretty much uh, all scholars who study ancient periods, you know, relating to the Hebrew Bible or New Testament use use these books as sources of information, but we try to do it critically, right? Recognizing that that what you have there cannot necessarily be taken literally, that not all of the information in it necessarily is true or necessarily is reliable, but that doesn't mean that you have to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say that you can't use any of it, right? So it's just like anything else. It's a matter of using these in a critical manner, and that's what scholars are trained to do, right? To do critical scholarship, which means that you you learn how to evaluate these documents and to use them in a sort of a responsible manner. How how accurate ha- have you found it in going into certain places? Because I know, for instance, uh, Masada. Uh, mm-hmm. you've got, how, how what what's your take after all these years of doing what you do and 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 using that as a a form not of his uh, history but as a reference? How how accurate or not inaccurate would you say? Well, okay, another another giant question, but. <laughs> First, let me just qualify and say that Masada is not mentioned not, in right, the Bible. That I know. So, I know. As soon as I so, said that, I right. thought that. So you realize it after you, yeah, as you were saying it, right? Right. So we'll leave we'll leave Masada aside because, of course, our our only ancient source of information about Masada is the uh, Jewish historian Josephus of right. the first century, and his his reliability. And he was an historian. That is, he wrote his work was intended to be history. Although, again, you can't understand that as meaning history with the modern expectation of objectivity that we have today. So how reliable he was as a historian, that's a whole other question. But in terms of the Bible, I mean, that's a huge question because it depends on what you're referring to exactly. Uh, In terms of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, generally speaking, although this is not necessarily so, but generally speaking, the, the farther back you go in time, the less reliable or the less historical reliability there is, right? So when you go back to, you know, the gen, you know, the book of Genesis, for example, and, you know, some of the earlier the Exodus, you know, like that, it's, it's far less reliable historically because, because the, um, those books were not actually written until many, many centuries after the events that they supposedly described happened. And so then you have to assume some sort of a very long, um, reliable oral process of transmission until those things get written down. And, and I, I, you know, from a scholarly point of view, I don't think anybody views much that's in those very early books as, as reliable historically. When you get to the later periods, like you get into the time of, you know, David Solomon and later than that, you begin to get some historically reliable information, but which information exactly is reliable and which is not depends on which 
scholar you ask. Right. So there's there's an enormous ver- variation among scholars. And then, of course, the New Testament is a whole other kettle of fish, right? Because, you know, the, the Gospels were written down within, let's say, two to three generations of the death of Jesus. And so that's far less time elapsed, let's say, than between the time when the Hebrew Bible was written down and the events that it describes happened. So, so there is, so, you know, the Gospels contain, let's say, overall, a, a lot of really interesting and I think somewhat valid information about Judaism and what's going on in Judea in the time of Jesus, exactly how much reliable information there is about Jesus himself. That's a whole nother, you know, that's a whole nother problem, right? So anyway, but so it depends on exactly, you, you have to single out a book, an episode, and then discuss it to see whether it might or might not be historically reliable. But I think it's a point to be made that that whole picture that you just painted be understood by people who are listening to this program to understand just as you as an archaeologist, you know, might use any information that you might, you know, glean from those books. I think that's important. You know, it's because there are people who believe every word that was written, of course, is utterly, totally. That's the fact. That's exactly how it happened. That's exactly where it happened. And, 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 you know, I think that's disputable, my opinion. Right. Well, let me, (laughs) let me just qualify and say, so yes, so, so absolutely. And I personally, I, have no interest in um, in undermining people's personal religious beliefs or faith. So, you know, my 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 feeling is people are welcome to believe whatever yeah, they want yeah, to believe. Right. But my my job as you know as a, as a professor at a at a university, a state university, is to educate the students and more broadly to educate the public. And so, you know, I always feel like okay, I'm just going to educate you. I'm going to tell you what this is, what we think, why we think it. And then, you know, after that, you can choose to believe whatever you want, right? So I, I, I view my job as sort of to inform and educate people. But I, but I do think that it's interesting to point it, to note it in terms of archaeology, not in terms of religion, mm-hmm. but in terms of archaeology. And I think that is important. And, you know, it gives you a bigger picture of how people are. You know, where you're coming from is how you perceive. <laughs> Is, that's a broad right. statement. Well, one, you know, one one of the one of the I think one of the misuses of archaeology in in the sort of public mind, or for archaeologists, one of the ways that archaeology gets misused uh, sort of publicly is to prove or validate the Bible. As there you somehow, go. Somehow, if yeah. we can find certain things, that it will prove that these things happened, and therefore that the events described in the Bible are true. And that is absolutely not the way it works. So that that's that's an absolute misuse of archaeology, and, and it does not work that way. I'm so glad that you said that, because then my long way around was, <laughs> and I'm not sure that I was going yeah. into that understanding, but that's really where I was going with that, and I think that that's an right. important point to make. Listen, you have been involved in some extraordinary digs, God bless you. I mean, I can I come? <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. I mean, this yeah, is like the go to our website, check it out. I would. Yeah. You have no idea. This is really, truly the dream of my life. But you're like the superstar of archaeology these days. It's true. You're like the female Indiana Jones, kiddo. I mean. <laughs> I, mean, I love oh. it. It's true. But walk, I mean, people it's love you. You me cringing. No, no, no. But people <laughs> love you. You do know that. I mean, you are well respected. You've earned quite, quite a, um, a, 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 the world of respect in, in the field. And you should be proud of that. And you should be uh, given kudos for that. So I'm doing that for you. I mean, I did a lot of research well, on you, you. And it's pretty cool. <laughs> but, but walk me through your work. For instance, this project that we mentioned that's not in the Bible, in the Roman uh, siege <laughs> works of Masada. I mean, I would love the story of Masada, um, the last stronghold of the Jewish resistance against the Romans. Give us the genesis of your work there. And, and, and when you went in there, what, what were you, I didn't even know, what were you looking for? What, what was the whole trip there for you? Um, yeah, so, well, my involvement with Masada actually goes back a really long time. So after I finished my bachelor's degree, um, which was in archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, uh, and, and where, by the way, Yigael Yadin, who, of course, excavated the top of Masada in the 1960s, he was one of my undergraduate professors at the oh. Hebrew University. Um, yeah, I know. He was amazing. I mean, he was he was just an amazing teacher. Um, so anyway, after I finished my bachelor's degree, I worked for three years as a tour guide at a field school along the western shore of the Dead Sea at Ain Gedi. And so I actually visited Masada literally hundreds of times over the course of the three years that I worked at Angeti. So I got to be very familiar with Masada very early on. And then, um, then eventually I, I came back to the U.S. and, and enrolled in the PhD program at the, at, uh, the University of Pennsylvania. 
And um, and then after I finished my coursework, I went back to Israel to work on my dissertation research, which was that had nothing to do with Masada. <laughs> but while I was working on my dissertation research, I was based in Jerusalem, and uh, it was just about then that Yadin died. He died in 1984, and after his death, his material from Masada was still unpublished. So some of the professors at the Hebrew University were put in charge of overseeing the publication. They had been my professors also when I was an undergraduate. And they contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in working on any of that material for publication. So I got involved in working on the uh, the military equipment, the weapons that were found in Yadin's excavations. And I worked on that. That was eventually published in Masada Volume seven, as I recall. And, um, and then in 1995, I was invited to co-direct the first and only ever excavations in the Roman siege works of Masada, because of course, you know that, that the Romans came and besieged Masada in either 72, 73 or 73, 74, uh, at the time of the first Jewish revolt, or a little after the official end of the revolt against the Romans. And so uh, Yadin, in his excavations in the 1960s, had concentrated on the top of the mountain where Herod's palaces were located. But at the foot of the mountain, we still have the remains of these very well-preserved Roman siege works. And that was what I was involved in in the summer of 1995. And it was really fascinating because we learn all about how the Roman army conducted a siege in the field. It's a kind of an aspect of the story of Masada that's, that doesn't get as much attention as sort of the rest of the story of Masada. So it was it was a wonderful opportunity. And, and again, I mean, you know, that, that that's pretty much in in your early success. Uh, let, let, mm-hmm. Let's let's jump ahead a little bit to to the Dead Sea Scrolls and 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 Qumran. And, and you're you're just, and I want to tell everybody by the way, Jody has a lot of books out. And all of them were well worth the read. But the archaeology of uh, Cameron and, and the Dead Sea Scrolls is a book that a lot of people, when I was talking, that I was having you on the show, said, yeah, you need to look at that. But that was <laughs> <laughs> So there's a lot of controversy involved. In, in this. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like to go where there's controversy. I can't help myself. It's just who I am. But, um, th- you kind of went against, uh, uh, what some other people were saying. You want to just give us a real quick on that one and, and talk about the Essenes? Oh. And, oh, yeah. I know. Right. Oh, like- wow. <laughs> um, okay. Yes. You've, and you're asking a really good question. So, uh, I did, I actually did get involved also with Qumran very, very early on in my career and, and I published, eventually published that book in 2002. Uh, which now I think I need to update, but I just, I don't have time to update it, but it doesn't need updating. But anyway, the, the, you know, the site of Qumran was excavated back in the early 1950s by a French biblical scholar and archaeologist named Roland Deveau, who, uh, who believed, and I, I believe him also, and so do I think the majority of scholars, who believed that the majority, that, that the Dead Sea Scrolls were deposited in the caves around the site of Qumran by the people who lived at Qumran itself. So what you have is are, is the ruins of a small settlement that was occupied by members of a Jewish sect who were the ones who used the Dead Sea Scrolls and deposited them in the surrounding caves. Um, this has been the subject of lots and lots of controversy. Everything about Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls is the subject of lots of controversy, as you said. <laughs> and one of the points of controversy has been the identification of the site of Qumran with with in recent years, some scholars have suggested that maybe Qumran was not a sectarian settlement, the settlement of a Jewish sect, but instead was something else, that it was a villa, a commercial entrepot, a manor house, a port, um, a pottery manufacturing center. Those alternative theories are based on divorcing the scrolls from the site of Qumran, because the nature of the Dead Sea Scrolls is such that once you look at the contents of the scrolls, you must you must identify the people who deposited the scrolls in the caves as members of a Jewish sect. So the only way you can identify Qumran as something other than a sectarian settlement is to argue that the people who lived at Qumran were not the same people who deposited the scrolls in the nearby caves. Well, I, I think there's both archaeological evidence and other evidence that, that, that connects the scrolls in the caves with the site of Qumran, and therefore we must identify Qumran as a sectarian settlement, as devoted. And again, I think that's a majority, it's fair to say that's a majority view among scholars, even until today. But you had to get your hand in that, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and I should just use, since you mentioned the themes, um, I think also a majority of scholars, although not necessarily everyone, identifies that Jewish sect with the Essenes. So the Essenes are a Jewish sect mentioned in some of our ancient sources, such as Josephus. And um, and 
So many scholars, including myself, identify the people who lived at Qumran uh, as members of this Essene movement. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. You are listening to the Hallie Kaiser Chain Show. My guest today, Jody Magnus, archaeologist extraordinaire and contributor to the new National Geographic Channel special, The Story of God with Morgan Freeman, airing April 3rd, 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll be back in a minute. Stay with us. Hi, this is Helly Kasser Jane. Are you enjoying the show? I hope so. And I hope that you'll tell your friends about it and help us grow our family. How can you help? That's easy. Share the link to the show with your friends or my show's player. And I would love it even more if you'd recommend they visit my website at HallieKesserJane.com. I look forward to seeing all of you there. So tell me this, when you leave and you have to be stateside and you go back to teaching and you go back to raising funds, how happy are you or how unhappy? I know you're happily married, right? But I mean, is it hard to come Uh, back? Is it hard not to be in the field? uh, Oh, I see. Um, no, actually, that's not that's not the case. So, um, hmm. you know, maybe there are archaeologists who like being in the field all the time. I, I don't like being in the field. I, I mean, I enjoy digging. I don't think you can be an archaeologist and not enjoy being in the field and digging. But the other but I don't know if people realize, you know, being in the field and digging is is really exhausting. It's, it's arduous. It's, you know, yeah. my dig is it's exhausting. It's exhausting for me because I'm in charge of it. And so it's it's a lot of work during the course of the year just to get everything organized, not just the fundraising, but a lot of other stuff as well. And of course, we're always working on, on various aspects of publication. But the actual experience in the field is extremely intensive. And, you know, we start digging at 5 a.m., which means we get up at 4 a.m., you know, and so... Uh, it, that that month is it's just an exhausting experience, and I, I it's fine for me. So at the end of the month, I've had you know my field work for the year, and I'm I'm ready to go on and do other things, including uh, starting to process things for publication and and you know get everything ready for the next season. So there are archaeologists who work longer seasons and and maybe who like to be in the field longer periods of time. Personally, for me, that's, you know, that month does it. Uh, when I was younger and I was not in charge of the excavations, you know, digging for a longer season wasn't as big a deal because I didn't have much responsibility. So the actual just digging was fun. You know, it's kind of like summer camp for adults in a way. <laughs> but um, but as the director of the excavations, it's, it's really very intensive, very exhausting. And um, and I don't I, I, I would not want to have I, I can actually have as long a season as I want, by the way, once I get a permit from the Israel Antiquities Authority, I, it's good for a year. I could dig for the entire year if I wanted to. But but that's my choice. So we dig for a month at a time. Okay. Um, I, and I and then I enjoy coming back and doing I mean, I, you know, I think that one of the things that I enjoy is doing lots of different things. So I like the teaching during the year. I like the interaction with the students, the teaching. People may not realize that the teaching and research are interlinked. You know, they. They feed into each other, so my my research enriches my teaching. My teaching enriches my research. Um, certainly, interactions with students uh, does the same thing. I enjoy going out and lecturing to different groups. So, you know, I I like having that diversity of activities over the course of the year. That's cool. Listen to me. You see what's going on in Iraq and in other parts of the the Middle East, yeah. and 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 the antiquities is going you know blown to smithereens. Does this not drive you insane? Because it drives me yeah. insane. Yeah, I it, mean it does, and I it's it's very painful, almost to the point where it's hard to actually even think about. And I, you know, I I wish I had, I wish I wish I had an answer. You know, I wish like so. Now I'm first vice president of the Archaeological Institute of America, which is the big the big archaeological organization in North America, and and in January I'll become the next president and. You know, it's one of the things that as an organization, of course, we've been very concerned with. And the problem is, you know, so people say to me, so what does the AIA do? Is What are we doing about it? And it's really hard. I mean, we issue, obviously, statements of condemnation, although even the current president wondered if we should be doing that because that just feeds into the publicity. So is it worth it to issue these condemnations and give them more publicity? I mean, how do we how do we respond? And I, I wish I had an answer to that. I, I don't. I think that the best thing that we can do right now is try to make sure, well, I think Ultimately, you know, obviously, the only way to solve the problem is to stabilize the region politically, but that's not an archaeological solution right. in the short term. Right. I think the only archaeological solution in the short term is to 
um, do what we can to make sure that we are protecting whatever sites we can protect to make sure that whatever is there has been documented as fully as possible so that if there is destruction, at least we will have as complete documentation as we can about, you know, the remains that existed um, and to try and support, you know, the archaeologists who are still on the ground in these places. Uh, and, you know, that's, um, but I mean, I don't think there's an, an easy solution. I also do think Part of it has to do with public education and outreach that people need to be, everybody, people, the, the native peoples in those regions and, and people in other parts of the world need to be educated about the importance of these remains for, you know, our, our shared world heritage, right? Right, right, right. It, it's it's a big picture. It's you, you almost wish it could be a movement and more people were aware of it and more people were involved and more people cared because, you know, just to have one small organization open up a mouth, that that uh, that doesn't accomplish what, what, what the group uh, culture could possibly do. So that's education, too, I suspect. I want to go back to... Uh, it is, yeah. Right, right. I want to mm-hmm. go back to Hukuk with you because you didn't expect to find what you found and you find these amazing mosaics Oh my God, they're gorgeous! Yeah. I mean, they are amazing. Wow! You didn't even, you, you, you yeah, didn't I haven't seen them in person, yeah, right? I can't even. We haven't published some. Of them. I yeah. can't even <laughs> yeah. imagine. I just cannot imagine. Yeah, but here's the deal for me. Exciting. You you said something. Now this is a quote. I'm going to take these discoveries have complicated my life in an unexpected ways. Some good, <laughs> some not so good, kiddo. I I just can't talk to me about that because I can get that. But you know, talk to the audience about that. Um, well, yeah. So, I mean, I, it's hard for me to say this without sounding like whiny. So I don't want to sound whiny because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just so, I feel so, you know, blessed to have this amazing discovery, but I just want to, so I just, before I, so before I start answering your question, just to say, I don't want this to come across. That You're not whiny. Or You're ungrateful in any way. You could never be um, whiny. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Promise. No, but, but, um, you know, when I, when I started this project at Hukok, uh, the goal was not to find mosaics. And, and in fact, we were not expecting to find mosaics because what I was looking for, I wanted to excavate a particular kind of, of synagogue building, ancient synagogue building in order to answer a particular set of research questions that I had relating mostly to questions of chronology dating. And the kind of building that I was looking for, which is in fact the kind of building that I found at Hukok, uh, typically is not decorated with mosaic. So I, I, that was not, it was not the plan that, oh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find a synagogue with amazing mosaics. That was not the plan. My plan was I'm going to go and I'm going to excavate part of a synagogue of this particular type to help answer this specific set of questions that I have. And my original goal was, in fact, only to excavate half of the synagogue building. I wanted to leave half unexcavated so that if in the future somebody wanted to check my results, they could. And it was going to be a relatively short project. I was actually just going to dig for five seasons. And now I'm at the end of five seasons and the end is not in sight. So so uh, what happened as a result of discovering the mosaics in our second season already was that I immediately realized that now I was going to have to excavate the entire synagogue <laughs> because because there was no way well not because I wanted to not because I I wanted to find all of the mosaics but because if I didn't excavate all the mosaics either another archaeologist would move in and finish it off or you know looters would come in and and you know so it was like okay so now I, my re, you know the whole, there you whole are. plan has been upended exactly. I have to now commit for a very long term. It's a much bigger, longer term project. And also because the mosaics, as spectacular as they are, are equally expensive in terms of uncovering them and conserving them. That's that's a huge part of my budget is the conservation. Wow. Part. Yeah. So um, so so that is why it, it you know, that was sort of the good news and the bad news. So the mosaics were the good news because, you know, they really are truly amazing. They're just so spectacularly important, but they also did make the project a lot more complicated than what I originally um, envisioned it as being. And, and, they've, and they've made this a much longer term project than I, than I originally had planned. So two questions comes to mind. Number one, when you first discovered the first mosaic, what did that feel mm-hmm. like? Were you completely... Oh, um, that was amazing. Uh, yeah, that was amazing. So, so what happened was uh, we, you know, we had been digging, we had found the wall of the synagogue first. We didn't know how far down the floor it was, but we found the top of the wall, part of the wall. And so we were then digging down inside the wall and through a lot of just layers of dirt and, you know, stuff like that. And we had no idea wh- where, at what level we would reach the floor. We knew the floor had to be somewhere underneath, but we didn't know exactly when we would reach it. 
And as we were digging through the dirt above what turned out to be the floor, we were finding a lot of little mosaic cubes mixed in with the dirt, which suggested there was a mosaic floor underneath. But again, we weren't, I had not anticipated finding a mosaic floor in this kind of a synagogue building. So um, eventually we did, we did reach the level of the floor. And the way that it happened was, you know, it's one of those unforgettable moments on an excavation. So it it was June 20th at 6 a.m. in 2012. So (laughs) it was a Wednesday. Um, So what happened is we had a student who had been digging through the dirt and he had been hoeing through the layers of the dirt and he had never been on a dig before. He had just finished his bachelor's degree and had never been on a dig, had not studied archaeology, but he was hoeing through the dirt and he felt his hoe clink on something. And he got very excited and he called me over and I took a little paintbrush and brushed the dirt. And the first thing that we saw was the face of this woman peering out through the dirt. And it was really unbelievable. So at that point, of course, everybody else came running over to see. And then I shut down the square and we called our site conservator to come. And she then took over and uncovered the mosaic. And um, it was it was very, very exciting. And yeah. And yeah, the rest, really they was. say, was, is history. Oh, my gosh. Unforgettable moments. I can just imagine. Oh, my gosh. I, and, and I imagine the stress that have, comes with being the person who <laughs> this is your baby now. That must be enormous. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine that. So listen to me. The National Geographic, let, let's get to what we're supposed to be talking about, but you know, I love you and I have to talk uh, about it. The National right. Geographic Channel, Morgan Freeman, The Story of God with Morgan Freeman, airing on the National Geographic Channel Sunday, April 3rd, 9 p.m. How'd you get involved? He just called you one day? What happened? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, no, what actually happened is uh, one of the producers, um, uh, James Younger, got in, in touch with me, and I had worked with him on another program uh, about 10 years earlier. Uh, it was the Science of the Bible series, and uh, I, so he had, you know, he and I had already worked together, and he knew who I was, and so he got in touch with me. This was, I guess, last summer or even before that. And, you know, asked if I would be willing to be a consultant. And, of course, I agreed. And so then I started to consult with them. So they were going at that time through various configurations of episodes and, and scripts and questions and things like that. And um, and then at some point, uh, they were also looking for people to appear, you know, to be interviewed and to appear on screen with Morgan. And uh, National Geographic eventually decided that they, they were happy to have me be included as one of the people and I was very happy, of course. And so then that's how that happened. And then in, so I continued to work with them on consulting and scripts and stuff like that. And then in October, they flew me to Israel and we filmed on site with, with Morgan. And that was really amazing. And then um, since then, I've been going over, you know, rough cuts and, and, and all of that stuff and checking, still checking things for accuracy. So I've been involved with it now for, you know, uh, more than a half a year, I guess. Uh, well, two yeah, things. One is, yeah, most of the year. Is he as adorable mm-hmm. as, is he as adorable as he comes across on screen? <laughs> you know, he is, he is just, yes. He's actually, a mensch, he is right? Just as you think he would be. So he is just as wonderful a person as you think he would be. It's it's really amazing because, you know, somebody who's that that level of right stardom and fame and everything, but he is he is just as wonderful and down to earth and, and, and amazing as as you just as you would think. I mean, really it was it was just beyond a privilege and a pleasure to be able to to work with him. The the other thing is the segment that you do in the first one, um I, I was lucky enough to see it and it's riveting. All the whole show is riveting riveting but yours your segment is is particularly uh interesting and it kind of comes out of the uh something the lost tomb of jesus segment uh talpia so uh uh-huh so yeah so talk to me just we don't have a lot of time here i mean give us some background on it because i think there's something to explore here just uh um it it tells us about you (laughs) because (laughs) (laughs) right so i'm i'm assuming then you're talking about the one that that is the the one on resurrection and talks and and then shows the uh tomb of you know the tomb of jesus the church of the holy Sepulchre and all of that is that Uh the right episode yeah Yeah, that's the one i saw that was really a funny i i that was a pretty funny story actually we had a bit of trouble in the church of the holy sepulcher filming in there but anyway um that's a whole other story (laughs) um but uh but you know there's the there there are in in Christianity, the, in general, sort of in Christianity, broadly speaking, the holiest 
site is the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which, according to Christian tradition, marks the spot where Jesus was crucified and buried, right? So you have Golgotha in there, which is the, the hill of the crucifixion, and then you have the tomb of Jesus, which is enshrined in a sort of a circular dome structure called the Rotunda. Um, I should mention, by the way, that, that this is not u- universally accepted as the spot where Jesus was crucified and buried by all Christians, but by many Christians around the world. And it is a tradition that goes back in time in Christianity as far as you can go. It goes back to the time of Constantine in the early 4th century, who was, of course, the first emperor to legalize Christianity in the Roman Empire, and he's the one who built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So we don't have any Christian churches that are earlier than the Church of the Holy Sepulchre than that period, and that, so, so we don't, so, so it's a really early Christian tradition, and because of that, most scholars um, therefore accept the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as the authentic spot where Jesus was crucified and buried, with the assumption that the local Christian community somehow preserved the memory of that tradition in the three or so hundred years between the death of Jesus and the time of Constantine. Um, Archaeologically, we cannot prove that Jesus was actually crucified and buried on that spot, but we do have some very interesting remains in the vicinity of the Church, and that is a series of Jewish rock-cut tombs, which date to about the time of Jesus, and which prove that there was a cemetery on that spot um, in the first century. And the reason why that's important is because if the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is authentic, it has to be located outside the walls of the city at the time of Jesus, and Jews buried their dead outside the walls of the city. So it didn't, so, so if that's the closest, that little piece of archaeological evidence is the closest that we can come to sort of verifying the authenticity of the tradition. To, to say that Jesus was actually laid to rest in one of these rock tombs there is a leap of faith that archaeology cannot prove, but at least we do have evidence of, of it being a Jewish cemetery in that period. So that's sort of, you know, the thing that we show there is we actually uh, film, you know, showing these, these rock cut tombs that survive in the area of the church from the time of Jesus. The Talpio thing is a whole nother, you know, that's a whole nother big kettle of fish. Um, that's a that's a modern claim that has no um, ancient basis, and in fact, the claim is made not by an archaeologist but by a filmmaker. Right. And I don't know of a single you know archaeologist actually who accepts the the claim of the Talpio tomb. It's extremely an extremely flawed claim. So that's you know that that's a whole other problem. I think what you said was quote this whole case is flawed from beginning to end. Leave it to Jody. Yeah. And, but at, at, you know, and and I think it's a it's it, it's well worth the point of raising because it has become kind of folklore now because the James Cameron uh, what was it uh, History Channel did that film? I can't remember. Uh, who did it. No, yeah, it uh, was the Discovery Channel. Discovery Channel yeah. did the film, and I know that that became kind of folklore, and and um, that's uh, something I know that you didn't agree with. I want to applaud you about something else. This is a lady with chutzpah. That's all I have to say. She has chutzpah. So, so <laughs> it's true. So we talked about this off air a little bit, and I said that um, in my intro, which you haven't heard yet, it says you're forthright and frank and fearless, and that is who you are. I like a woman who says what she means and means what she says. So I'm going to go to an article that was in the New York Times. Uh, published, <laughs> I'm so I have to do it because you know I, this is my baby. This this ticks me off. Um, it was, uh, what was it? It was in 2015. It published an article of the New York Times questioning whether the first and second ancient Jewish temples existed. It was a political hack job. We all know that. And in my opinion, in line with the Times now story, this is me talking, not you, Jody, storied anti-Israel sentiment. So you were quoted in that article, right? The logical thing uh-huh. would be to dig, you said, if you did that, you'd probably cause World War III to break out. It's not even in the realm of possibility. So, meaning trying to find out what the, about the temples. But mm-hmm. truth well said, the, the uproar from scholars, Jews, politicians, both here and abroad, forced the Times to actually issue a correction due to clear evidence. And you went ahead and then wrote a lengthy piece. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I love yeah. it. Why Why shouldn't you? I mean, why should you be shy about that? Because I think it was... No, I'm not... I, it's I'm wonderful not that you no, did no. that. So, Somebody so, needed so, to so, do it, and you did it. Talk to right. me. No, no, no. So what what happened is that um, at some point, I was contacted by a reporter from the New York Times who was who had been asked to write this article. You know, what evidence do we have of the temp- the first and second temple from the Temple Mount? And um, this apparently was brought about by you know complaints from various readers at the Times over the course of the years. You know, when the Times had said that you know uh, referred to the alleged temples on the Temple Mount or the supposed temples on the Temple Mount, and various readers had questioned why are you qualifying that there were temples on the Temple Mount? 
So this reporter was put in charge of writing an article to, to you know, explore what evidence do we actually have for the existence of the two temples. And I, among other people, he contacted me. So I spent an hour on the phone with him going over a lot of evidence. I mean, you know, pretty systematically going through an awful lot of stuff. And then um, when the article came out, this very trite quote was, you know, the only thing that, that, that was ascribed to me was this really trite quote that was that did not in any way support, you know, the, the case that there had been two temples, all the evidence that I'd gone through. And, and, the, and the article ended up kind of waffling, you know, in the end. And I was so I was so I was upset because I felt like here I'd gone to all this trouble and I felt like the evidence itself was being misrepresented, uh, that it was not accurate. And so I and I felt like I had been misquoted or not misquoted, but my my you know, what I had told him had been taken out of context and misrepresented um, because, in fact, what I had spent an hour with him on the phone doing was was marshalling all of the evidence that we have for the existence of the temples. And that was not conveyed in the quote that, that was taken out of context and ascribed to me. So I was, you know, I was upset about that. And I contacted the Times, the editor, to say I would like to submit, you know, a letter to the editor that corrects this. And the editor said, fine, it has to be within the following word length. And I and and actually the reporter then contacted me as well. And I, you know, I, I explained to the reporter that I felt like my, my comments had been taken out of context and that the evidence that I presented had not been actually conveyed in the article. So anyway, the upshot was the, a couple of things that my letter was published. I had to, again, shorten it. It was short, very much shortened from what I had originally written. But, it was, you know, my shortened letter was published. And the New York Times, as you said, published uh, eventually a retraction or a correction of what they had originally presented. So they called it a happened. correction, but a lot of people were not happy with even the correction because the correction even continued to intimate that, um, you know, the, the, the temples, uh, the two temples weren't actually there. And as you say, you, that's not a place you can go dig without having World War III. So, I mean... <laughs> right. No, you can't. But, but, but the fact of the matter is that we have a lot of... I mean, we have a lot of evidence for the existence of, of the two temples. So you would have to... you would, And not necessarily archaeological in the sense that we don't have the actual buildings, although we do have, I mean, we have the Temple Mount for crying out loud. So, I mean, the whole platform is, you know, um, but but there's a lot of, of evidence, both both Jewish evidence, but also, you know, non-Jewish evidence. I mean, we have writers like Tacitus, the Roman historian, who describes the destruction of the Second Temple. So, I mean, there's there's an awful lot of evidence out there that's not, let's say, necessarily Jewish, or if you want, you know, that... And and you just you, you can't discount it. I mean, you can't say otherwise. Then you have to discount the everything that we have from antiquity and say that we don't have anything. Because, I mean, you have to get into that kind of right. like, well, nothing is reliable. So so it all becomes so politically motivated. I mean, I I don't think that archaeology should be used for for political purposes. I don't think archaeology should be used to validate modern political claims one way or another. But I also think that it's an, it's equally reprehensible to um, to take to to interpret archaeology, you know, to deny the existence of certain things because of of political agendas, right? So um, you handled you it brilliantly. Example, you know, in my current excavations, we're excavating the 1948 village above the synagogue as part of our excavations because I am, in fact, interested in all of the period. I mean, I don't think as archaeologists we should prioritize. Our job is to is to learn about the past as completely as possible. So it's not a matter of prioritizing prioritizing and saying this is more important because it serves a, a particular you know modern agenda or a modern purpose or politics or whatever. Our job is to learn about the past through what we dig up and whatever we dig up, it's you know that's what we have. And so um, so it, it, so I you know that that's what got me going about that whole New York Times thing. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I'm with you on that one. And and there's been a series of of, of that kind of uh, reportage that uh, makes one nervous in these times. <laughs> that's how, ha, and again, that's Hallie speaking, not Jody. So, so Jody, yeah. all the all the study, all the brilliant people you've gotten to speak to in your storied career, all that you've uncovered. We're here today partly to talk about the story of God with Morgan Freeman. I'm curious when you uncover, for instance, the mosaics at Hukuk. Hukuk. I can't even say. That. <laughs> I don't know why I have such a hard time with that. I don't know. Or the Dead Sea Scrolls or negate with some filmmakers assert as truth that they've discovered the burial grounds of Jesus. They did on the Discovery Channel's documentary. We just talked about the tomb of Jesus. I wonder what you think. And this is kind of off the beaten track, but, you know, 
it's the holidays are coming Easter soon Passover we're talking about all of this and you know the and 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 the uh, documentary you're now involved in I wonder what you think God is thinking listen to me or if you ever think God history is God or Muhammad's or whomever it is you believe in whatever the higher power might be camouflage of truth in a way I, I this is kind of out there but that's my brain maybe we've never really we'll never have very clearly defined answers only a mosaic good word since that's what you're involved in, of questions. And maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. That the great lesson to accept each other's truth, period, and not necessarily to get definitive answers. Maybe it's that, or it's a higher power is laughing at us, you know, like history, we have history, we have time for a reason. Because at the end of the day, right? I don't know. And maybe again, it's my chain of crazy thought. I, I don't know, maybe you think that some days and others you have a whole chain of different thoughts about what all of this and what you do and what people like you do is really all about, what this, you know, gathering of historical data is. Talk to me. Is that is that too far out there? What I'm where I'm going? Um Or well, you get it. I'll, so I'll just I'll just say that that the concepts like God and higher powers are not generally in my mind when I work <laughs> at all. Um, so it's not like I'm I'm you know, that's not like one of the motivations. I mean, I'm, I, I, I actually consider myself a scientist and, and I have a set of questions that I'm hoping to answer, um, with, with incomplete data because, because what we have from the past is only a very small percentage. You know, only a small percentage of writings have survived. Only a small part of ancient remains have survived. And so our data are very incomplete. So it is true. It's sort of like not, I don't know, mosaic, but more like a puzzle that we're trying to put together. Mm-hmm. I always like to say that. So it's like, you know, the past was like a puzzle where we're trying to, you know, put back the picture or reconstruct the picture um, when we're missing most of the pieces and we don't know what the original picture looked like. So you can take the, the, the few pieces that we have and you can reconstruct them in various ways, right? And so it's a matter of taking the data that we have and trying to account for what we have as fully as possible in the most in the most supported way possible, right? So what 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 reconstruction is the one that that um, accounts for pretty much all of the evidence that we have um, that doesn't manipulate it, you know, too badly, that, that kind of, you know, accords. So that that's really what, what we're trying to do. And I think that's one of the things that makes archaeology and studying the past so fun is the fact that there never can be definitive answers because we are missing so much evidence. And especially in archaeology, every, you know, you look in the paper every day, there's a new discovery that has somehow changed our understanding of something or other. So there really is no definitive. And, and uh, that, that sort of, that that I think is what makes it so much fun. And that's okay too, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. If you want definitive answers, then probably archaeology is not a discipline for you because <laughs> you're not you're not gonna get it. You're just gonna get but that I think people like mysteries, you know, archae and that's you know, on T V programs when they have archaeology stuff, they're always like the mystery of this, the mystery of the Bible, the mystery of the pyramids, the mystery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, whatever. People like mysteries and archaeology is just one big mystery story. I've been speaking with Professor Jody Magnus, the Senior Endowed Chair in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the Keenan Distinguished Professor for Teaching Excellence in Early Judaism. Sunday, April 3rd, 9 p.m. Eastern, Professor Magnus can be seen on the National Geographic Channel when it premieres The Story of God with Morgan Freeman which takes viewers on a trip around the world to explore different cultures and religions on the ultimate quest to uncover the meaning of life, God, and all the questions in between. To learn more about Professor Magnus and her important work, visit her website at jodymagnus.org. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Helen Cancer Jane Show, a production of Resec LLC. Associate Producer, Suzanne Probst. Music by Tony Rosales Jazz. Visit HallieCasserChain.com. <laughs>